Well, uh, that uh, first session was a warm-up, and uh, we had some softballs going back and forth there, but as the day progresses, we're going to get better at talking about uh, more difficult issues, and we're just going to continue to turn up the grace and truth and try to honor and uh, Christ and model something important here. I've got two more uh, good friends here, uh, Pastor Stephen Furtick and uh, pra Pastor Crawford Loritz. And uh, a lot of talk these days about the gospel, 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 gospel centered, gospel this, gospel that, gospel everything, gospel, you know, um, reductionism to the max, gospel everywhere. Um, nevertheless, this is the most precious message on the face of the earth. Nothing matters more than the gospel. None of us want it diluted or distorted, but in our desire to preserve and protect it, we can't fail to let it loose. And so you are both men who have uh, spent your ministries thus far extensively engaged in preaching the gospel, getting the gospel out, seeing people come to Christ. And I want to have a good discussion about uh, preaching the gospel, uh, what is the content of the gospel, what are the non-negotiables involved in the gospel, what has to be there for it to be the gospel, and how can we spur one another on to greater faithfulness. Uh, Crawford, I'm going to go to you first. How can we spur one another on to greater faithfulness in gospel ministry? Here's four minutes uninterrupted. Share your heart with us. Well, I think we need to step back a little bit because, um, you know, we, we gravitate in recent years. We get, we get confused between what is the gospel and the effectiveness in sharing the gospel. Nice. And I think we've gotten sloppy in terms of the framework. And the bigger problem is, is that we, we don't question our strategies. We've become so terribly pragmatic that because it produces this result, then the results defines the theology, and that's when we get messed up. Good. And so the pragmatism takes us to a wrong place. I think uh, we need to hold intention, uh, both what the Bible says, the content of our message is that does not change, as well as what is the holy, anointed, God-given motivation and approach. And if we're clear about those two things, it forms the, the bank of a powerful river where the stewardship of the gospel is maintained. Give the two banks again. The, well, it, 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 the content of the message itself, what the Bible says the, the, gospel, the is. gospel is. Secondly, what is the holy approach, anointed approach given to us in the scriptures that maintains the boundaries? And then the pragmatism flows out of that. But we're making assumptions about those two things in the way that we're approaching the gospel these days that's got us into trouble. People end up in, in heresy not because they choose to believe a heresy, but because they gravitate toward what works and they edit the content rather than questioning uh, you know, what is working and why, why it's working. And so there's this huge stewardship responsibility that we have as bearers of the gospel. Another word I like to say, James, is that um, you know, we, we've given too much of a broad definition of the gospel. Um, you know, I, in some circles we say the whole of the Christian life is the gospel. Well, I could argue, well, yeah, that is so. But in its restrictive sense, what does it take to enter the kingdom of God? Yeah. What's the part of the message that can't be left out? Because if you leave it out, the guy's not going to heaven. Exactly. And, you know, Paul did not have a speech impediment when he wrote 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I hear you. Uh, I mean, he's very clear about Sermon what... coming, sermon coming. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, I actually hesitated in preparing for this. But I, I do, if you'll indulge me, I do, I do want to read these verses because it's very important. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 through 11, 
Paul says, for I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church. Now down to verse 11, whether then it was I or they, and here's a line, so we preach, and so we believe. And there are the four basic elements of the gospel. Yeah, it's really Clearly. Not re- it's not refutable. You can see in my Bible here, I had actually written gospel. I mean, it's, it's so good to come back to that and yeah. be reminded that these uh, are the non-negotiables. I love your description of the banks on a river. Over here, you have the content of the message that can't change. Over here, you have the methods, which will be everything that they can be, provided right. we stay within these river banks. And uh, Pastor Stephen, I love the comment that was on the uh, opening video to this session in regard to you. I think it represents your heart very well, presenting the message creatively isn't watering it down. And I just love to hear you speak without restriction on your heart in these matters. Yeah, no, thanks. Um, I don't disagree, obviously, with 1 Corinthians 15 and the basic elements of the gospel. I would never give a gospel presentation without talking about the sinless life of Jesus Christ, without addressing that man in his sinful state needs Jesus Christ, needs a savior. I would, I would never leave out the cross, I would never leave out the resurrection, mm-hmm. and I would never leave out the need to be saved by grace through faith. Mm-hmm. It, it's not of works. But I guess what sometimes I see happening when we hijack the term gospel mm-hmm. is that we start making it mean our particular propensity to believe certain things and our categorization of the way things should be said that I think outstrips the intention of defending the gospel. So I love the gospel, and I think the greatest evidence of that is that I'm giving my life to preach the gospel, not that I'm critiquing the gospel. I think that making sure that we keep a deep and solid love for the essentials is so important, but here's here's a little bit of my story. So I was a traveling youth evangelist, went to all these little churches and as I was traveling, you know, I saw a lot of different things that were good, but I also saw a lot of what I thought was confusing, coercive, manipulative invitations where I saw kids coming forward crying because they'd been up for four nights straight at camp and they, they didn't understand any message if there was one presented even, and they would respond. And it, it became so it became so troubling to me that when we started our church, and I've never told you this part of my story because now we give really bold invitations and, and we, we really do try to lead people to a, a place of public profession. But for the first little bit of our church, I wouldn't do it. I would not give a public invitation. I was so worried that I wouldn't do it right or I was so reactive to what I'd seen done wrong that I actually took the message of Jesus, which I believe is primarily offensive, double meaning, saying that it offends and it also is on the offense, it's moving forward. He came to seek and say, and I was playing defense with the message. And what happened for me was through studying the scriptures and, and, and through really seeing people far away from God come into our church and our friends invited them, I, I started to come under conviction that it was, it was wrong for me It was wrong for me to not invite people boldly to receive Christ. And I I started reading things like about the wheat and the tares in Matthew 13. I've studied that passage a lot. And I I don't think it means that we shouldn't ever try to see if someone is showing the fruit of repentance or help them understand what that looks like. Not at all. But I do know that it means that that I ultimately can't judge someone's heart. Mm -hmm. And and I started reading like the book of Acts. We read that a lot when our church was starting over and over again. how 3,000 were baptized and added to their number that day. Mm-hmm. And there was a public, immediate profession of their faith. And so, so now at our church, I, I try to focus as much of my energy as I can on the authenticity mm-hmm. of the message to make sure that, that I am presenting the truth of the gospel. Mm-hmm. And then 
to, to leave the Lord uh, that, that ultimate judgment. Well, and Lord then on knows, our back Lord end knows those that are his. Of, our, of our processes, to have a great church where these new Christians can be a part of a small group where they can hear great biblical messages where I preach through great chapters and books and passages of the Bible. That's all my responsibility too. It's not I throw the seed and hope it turns out, but I, I do believe that the Lord has called me primarily to preach the gospel, uh, not to critique it. And there is a place for us to achieve clarity, but I don't think there's, I don't think there's anything wrong with me saying, I'm gonna err on the side of urgently inviting people who are far away from God, lost without Christ, dying and going to hell. I'm gonna urgently try to get them to respond to the gospel knowing God alone can save them. That's been our, our stance. Amen, amen. That's a big thumbs up, big time. Yeah. Big thumb. You guys in the back row there, you thumbs up with that too? Or or you think they're Please, broken Bishop. there? Come on. <laughs> <laughs> right. Against Bishop, if, if you put thumbs down, I'll quit the ministry right now. <laughs> I'll go home. Yeah. Well, uh, that's fantastic, uh, Stephen, what you just said. And Crawford, I'd like you to kind of just respond and share your thoughts on that. I mean, you were part for many years of a, Campus just tell a bit of your story, yeah. your crusade yeah. years. Yeah. They're certainly yeah. very committed to pressing people to the side. Absolutely. And, and yet you're reformed more in your leaning and persuasion, though I know you don't like any labels yeah. uh, other than the Word of God and, and and yeah. the testimony of Christ, but just speak back in, yeah. into that. First of all, I want to affirm everything that you said, Stephen. I'm, I'm doing cartwheels in my heart because I really believe that that is the core balance. And I want to say this too. I think, you know, what we forget inherent in the gospel is urgency. Yeah. It is urgency. And that is the reason why there's certain methods, you know, lifestyle evangelism, taking time and being relational. That's okay. Taking a guy to baseball games for 30 years, looking yeah. for a place to slip yeah. Jesus in. <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, I didn't have exactly that in mind, but, all right, you, all know, right. you, you know, um, and, and, I'm, and I'm really serious about this. I think what we have lost is the fact that hell is forever. Yes. Thank you. Forever. Yes. And uh, um, the style of preaching today that is so conversational and nonchalant and journey-ish uh, is, is not biblical preaching. There is an air of urgency that's inherent in the cross work of Jesus Christ and the fact that we don't control the clock nor the calendar. I'm going to stand up. This is Eric Mason. Every time you really love what somebody's saying, you stand up. <laughs> All right. It doesn't work for you, James. I but, know. Uh, <laughs> that's, kind of a, that's, that's kind of a brother move. That's yeah, kind yeah, of a brother move. Come on, keep yeah. going. I just yeah, love what yeah, you're saying. Yeah, yeah. So, so, you know, I, I am, I, I'm, I'm, I'm all, all over that. And I think one of the things I really press into our young preachers uh, to, uh, is that please don't be casual about eternal matters. The, the second thing that I, I, I would say to, and I'm just really affirming what you're saying, uh, Stephen, is that you know, the balance that you have to hold in tension is that you give people an opportunity res to respond. You don't get them to respond. And that's the tension that you have to have. And that's, that's the holy approach in, in, in 2 Corinthians chapter uh, 2 when Paul says that uh, we're not so many, like so many who are peddling, peddlers. peddlers. Yeah. And that word was used of, of winemakers who diluted the wine and, 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 you know, they had this little little scam and they pass it off as a real thing. You don't do, you don't dilute the gospel and you don't give a little sugar stick message and smoke and mirrors and, and all that kind of thing to get people to respond. But you do preach it with urgency, you do preach it with relevance, you do put the clothes of the people on the message, but you don't violate that message and you give them an opportunity to respond. Mm -hmm. And uh, a little word I, I want to say too, um, I think sometimes our theological constructs get us in trouble. One of the things that I warn a lot of younger guys, and I can say this some credibility because I have reformed leanings, but one of the things I remind some of the younger reformed guys is this. Please stop front-loading the gospel. When you're drowning out there in Lake Michigan, don't describe the features of the rescue boat. Right. You point them to Jesus, and uh, Jesus is, and don't, don't cloud the cross. The, clo the cross is simple. complexity. That the cross is simple and profound and eloquent enough. Mm. You point them to Jesus, and you let Jesus do his work. Mm. 
And I think whenever we, sometimes we get, we get confused with our constructs. And so we preach the gospel, but it's not really preaching the gospel. We're preaching what somebody else says about the you gospel. You mean like kind of having a mental checklist that I'm ticking off that's the truth right. to myself, that I'm fitting some categories that's instead of just opening my heart and absolutely. proclaiming the saving power of Christ. I'm lost. He died. I turn. He, I'm lost. He died. He rose again to demonstrate that he's God. I turn from my sin and I trust him. Amen, amen, amen. I know you want to speak to that. Yeah, You're so I, passionate about it. I love that, Pastor Loritz. The only thing that uh, was kind of in my heart while you were talking about conversational style is that even that, to me, is some language that we need to make sure we're not alienating any of our brothers that are preaching the gospel because, you know, Paul said in Acts 20 that he was pleading through tears. And then so sometimes there's that intensity. Sometimes there's a shout. Sometimes that the Lord may give someone a real boldness that comes through in a different way and I guess because I'm young and I'm still learning my way around a lot of stuff I want to be very careful uh, to understand someone's context to understand the the entirety of their ministry I've met so many people who I heard they don't preach the gospel and then when I got to know them I this saw that yeah. they absolutely, absolutely. preach the gospel and 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 I want to be real careful because you know public professions of faith like there's a few things going on in my life right now where we we just had a funeral for a 17 year old boy yesterday before I came out here. His parents are top leaders in our church. He uh, died in, a, in, a, in an accident uh, on the 10th night of our 12 night revival. His parents had been there all 10 nights of the revival. They left the meeting where Bishop Jakes had actually preached for me to find out their son had died. No, no drinking, good kid, love the Lord. And so they, they asked me would I make something meaningful out of it by preaching his funeral. Of course I did, rearrange the flights and I didn't plan on using this or anything, but I had his, his memorial thing in my Bible. When, when I gave that message, I, I pleaded with the people. I actually did preach from Acts 20, 24. Yeah, his name is Riley. And there's a situation where I've got hundreds of people in that church that need to hear the gospel. And my theology tells me that God will save them whether or not they raise their hand, whether or not they stand up. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Mm. Um, I know there's no magic to this, mm. but there was something about in that funeral where they had just lost their son, and I asked their permission to have people raise their hand if they were placing their faith in Christ, that I wanted to be very careful because in that emotional situation, you can get every teenager in the room to stand up because we love Riley and we feel bad about what happened. So I slowed down. And I said, this is the gospel. It wasn't loud. There was, there was just a, a real clear sense of let me get this right. And when the people raised their hands, I told the parents and the family and the 13-year-old girl, I said, look around. And I want you to know Riley's life wasn't in vain. Mm -hmm. Now that to me is an example of I could have done that privately. And I'm not saying everyone that raised their hand gave their life to Christ. And when we talk about these things, I try to be careful to say this is how many people raised their hands to indicate I don't know their heart, I don't know their soul, but if I'm gonna err, it's gonna be on the side of preaching the gospel, not critiquing it, and asking people to boldly respond to the gospel. Yeah. Well, I appreciate that very much, and if I could just kind of circle in here before we go to the bullpen. I, uh, what just happened in that exchange, beyond, and we're not here to fix anybody, right. we're here to listen and to learn from one another, and what just happened in that exchange is my heart so much. When you said, you know, it's urgency, proclaiming the gospel, not just, not, not just having a chat with people. I mean, I really got that. But then when he also stepped in, and I'm sure you'd agree, brought in the balance of saying, but hang on for a second, preaching is truth communicated through personality. Yeah. And some people might have a gentle tone, some may, people have a strong tone. It's not the tone that's the urgency. It's the sense that the gospel is leading to a response. Right. You know, you know in, manner, in, in light of all these things, what manner of men ought we to be? And, and, and urging people to respond to the message that they've heard. And we could talk for a long time about what are appropriate ways to do that and what's the best way. I've done it poorly, I've done it well. I try mainly just not to do it the same way every time mm -hmm. and to think about it thoughtfully even as you adjusted your method in the context of that funeral. So I think that's real helpful. I'd like to hear from some of the brothers over here. Rather not call on anybody, why doesn't somebody just jump in and, and uh, get us rolling here? Who wants to go first? James, you know, one of the good things is the fact that we're giving an opportunity for people to step over the line of faith. 
Yeah. yeah. You know, whether it's done well, sometimes we don't do it quite so well, but thank God opportunities are being given. That's what's diminishing in the churches. We want to applaud and reignite that flame to give people opportunities at every turn to step over the line of faith. Yeah. I had one guy say to me, Wayne, I raised my hand four times. It was, a, it was on the fourth time that I really got saved. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I got saved so many times a little kid going to church. I mean, to this day, I don't really know which one that took, but I'm glad to know. Uh, I mean, Lord never told me that's which right. one, but I'm glad to know I'm his that's today. Right. That's right. I mean, you think that's funny? <laughs> All right. Uh, Bishop? Well, I, I think it's a very interesting, provocative conversation. I, I, what I'm careful while I respect both viewpoints, and I, I don't think that they're contradictory one to the other, and I don't think that they have to be held exclusive uh, one to the other, but they are parallels of, of the same truth. I, I also think that it is important that we don't, we, we, we are in an age that we want to come up with a, a recipe for everything. You, first you must do this, and second you must do that, and third you must do that, or, or you're not legitimate. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that when we try to get down methodology to a science, we negate the mysticism of the cross. Uh, a, a Jesus who healed a blind man by a spoken word and then the next time makes his spittle and, and clay and tells him to go wash in the pool of Siloam. If we studied it, we would walk away and say, well, you know, if you don't mix spittle and clay, you're not healed. It, it, and we keep trying to formulize something that is beyond formula. And, and I think that different people are effective in different ways. And sometimes we will excommunicate someone that God is using differently and, and very effectively, but differently from us. Yeah. And, and, and we all think differently. It's not just that we preach differently. Uh, as, as Pastor Stephen said, we, we process differently. And uh, this same problem is the same problem we have in our academic systems, that if you don't learn it the way I learn it, you can't learn. And when children have learning differences, they can learn it a different way. And we have speaking differences, but as long as we end up at the end result, mm -hmm. that we bring them to the cross of Jesus Christ, yes. that their souls are, their sins are remitted by the washing of the blood, and we teach them the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord, our methodology cannot always be deduced down to the science of, uh, of what we think is appropriate in our setting, and we all function very, very differently. I think that's very, very important. So well great. said. Well said. You know, I had, a, uh, I had a conversation not so long ago with Bill Hybels with our group of pastors that meet here in the Chicago area, and he was leading an interesting uh, discussion with his staff on many different campuses. He had all of his staff reflecting on this point. Write down the five things. He, said, he chose the number five. You know, that's not... Uh, scientific or magical. Write down the five things that if you were to leave one of these things out of your gospel presentation, a person get, couldn't get saved. And they'd been through several months of discussing what are those things? What are, he was very concerned the gospel was getting given out in so many places. I'm not always in the room. How are they saying this? We got to get on the same page about this. I respected the process he was leading him through. Mark, you're quick. Um, <laughs> Give me your list. Five things. You better have these in the gospel, or or we're in danger of oversimplifying, which none of us want to do. One sinless God. I've sinned against Him. He came as Jesus, lived without sin, dead, buried, risen, faith in Him alone for salvation. I, I would. You got to get to sin. You got to get to Jesus. You got to get to resurrection. You got to get to repentance and faith. There's and those five are, right there. Those are the big ones. Yeah. yeah. I agree. Yeah. Well done, Jack. What would you add to that? Uh, you can't add to that. <laughs> I would just. I would hey, man, just, let's don't add to that. <laughs> I, I would, I, you know, uh, but 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 to turn this just so we were, you were talking about uh, professing professing your faith and the way we do that and the creative ways that you can do that. But God gave us the the pattern for confessing your faith in New Testament baptism, and um, you know I, I would be interested in, in hearing you men reflect on your views on uh, baptism. Uh, and not in, not, in the, not in the sense of we do it this way or that way, but how do you view the, because to me. It's rule in confession. It, 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 to me, I, I don't know how they came forward and what, what, what happened, how they separated them on the day of Pentecost, the 3,000. Uh, but what we do know is they were all baptized. So somebody counted them, somebody took their names, something happened that identified these guys as believers and it was baptism. So uh, our, our, to me, evangelism is not incomplete until you take them to that step of obedience and faith. Stephen, respond to that. Yeah, Pastor Jack, the first time I met you, you came out to our church last year and we were baptizing people, spontaneous baptisms. The first time I met him, 
I was like, this is going to be a fun one for you to come to because I got up, I preached on what it means to have faith in Christ. Then I preached on what baptism is. I talked about the fact that it's a public identification of your association with Jesus Christ, that it's not an act that saves you, that it's not a church membership issue. In my theology, it's a Jesus identification issue, and it's an important step of obedience. Uh, We did the series called Follow, and I talked about following Christ is not like following someone on Twitter. I followed uh, Justin Bieber on Twitter on the stage for everybody to see, and I was like, he gives me some command, he gives me some tweets. I either uh, read them or I don't. Jesus gives commands. The first command he gives us is to follow him in the waters of baptism, and I taught it the best that I could, and I talked about how this day can be that day, just like it was in Acts 2, and invited people to come, and by God's grace, you were there. We were baptizing entire families for those two weeks. We just saw so many people baptized, and I I would say that it's very important to our church. That is my preferred way. Uh, I wish that every time I gave an invitation that we could baptize everyone right there, right then, and uh, we've done that several times, and and I agree with you, it is so important in our theology. Uh, I baptized my son uh, this past Sunday to finish our revival, my firstborn son, and uh, he's only six, (laughs) and I had somebody on uh, Twitter saying that I made yet another false convert when they saw the picture of me baptizing my son. That's just wrong. That's why you got to stop being on Twitter and just go out for ice cream with your son. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Bring it up because a lot hang of on, people... Hang on. I want them to hear you. Hang on. Hang on. I want them to hear yeah, you. Yeah, that's funny. And, and, and I... <laughs> I mean, I think, I think it's funny, and I appreciate your humor to it, but it ain't funny. Right. Because at the same time, a lot of the people who are attracted to this type of event and, and a lot of the people who who might look into this to try to figure out who we're with yeah. and we're playing games about this and Jesus is going, you're supposed to be with me and, and yes, there's a core gospel message but the fact of the matter is I had people getting baptized in our revival this week. We had an old school Holy Ghost revival and I had people on Twitter finding those individuals that were sharing about their baptism experience, picking them off one by one and tweeting at them about how their baptism didn't count because I preach a false gospel. Now, we could say that's just the fringe. Hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. Uh, let's have a little congregational meeting here. How many people think that's pathetic? <laughs> that is pathetic. I all hope right? we all that's agree. That's just great with that. wickedness. But there's something going on in the message that we're presenting sometimes that, that gives liberty and license. And of course, there are obnoxious people who are very loud. But the fact is, my people who are on Twitter trying to participate and share their faith, they don't know the difference. Mm. And so we've got to be very clear. That's why I said, Pastor Loritz, I want to make sure that I'm very clear that I believe in, in a strong gospel presentation, but I want to be really, really slow to judge someone as a false prophet or a false teacher. And I want to love the gospel, but I want to love it actively and offensively by preaching it and not critiquing it. And I, 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 hope, I hope we feel the same way, and I hope yeah. that message can come across from us. Yeah, let me clarify yeah. something. I wanted to clarify this earlier. I don't disagree with you. When I say passion and urgency, I'm not talking about tone. Right. I'm not talking about style. I think you can be just as urgent, just as passionate by being polite, but people sensing the priority and urgency in your heart. So I'm not talking about tone, and uh, I'm not talking about style necessarily. <laughs> But there is an arrogance that sometimes sets in when we elevate our approach, our strategy to the gospel, uh, that we take that sense of an urgent response off the table. Sure. And so that's the only thing I'm talking about. I'm not talking about how it's done, but the yeah. fact that it is there. I really heard you saying, honestly, and this is good listening. Mm. This is really good listening. I, I heard you saying uh, really uh, the concern not so much with the content of the gospel, but people who might even preach the gospel uh, carefully and accurately, but without the urgency of this demands a decision. Now, how you call for that decision, how you help people get toward that decision, uh, we do it a lot of different ways. And I think that what uh, Pastor Graham has said that, uh, and what you've affirmed, that the most biblical way for a person to confess their faith in Christ is not really to sign a card or to walk an aisle, which I don't think you have a, even even room in the front of your church for people to come forward. I, I don't think it's signing a card or walking an aisle, and I've had people raise their hands, and I don't think that's wrong. But the biblical 
mandate is for people to picture the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ through publicly confessing him in baptism. It's not what saves you, but it's the first thing saved people do. It's the first command Jesus gave, yeah. and we need to be driving toward, within the framework of our own personality, we need to be driving toward the urgency of calling for a response. Yes, there's a reason why in the Great Commission baptism, Jesus, from the mouth of the Master himself, puts that in the Great Commission. Amen. Amen. There's a reason for that, and I think mm -hmm. it, it, I agree. It is it is an act of obedience. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. I have some friends who preach real creatively, and I try to be creative. I feel like some of my friends they take shots because of what they'll do to get people's attention, and sometimes they're they're portrayed as being stupid or being inauthentic because of the things they do. And we know that the power is in the gospel and we know that the power is in the foolishness of the cross and we can never let our faith rest in men's wisdom. But I just applaud my friends who are willing to tear off the roof Amen. to get somebody on a mat to Jesus. And I think the more that we can affirm that creativity. I'm gonna stand up again. Meanwhile, while our <laughs> teenagers are going to hell, we might be tempted to criticize someone's methodology we align ourselves, I think, more closely with the Pharisees who are sitting on the front row to try to see how Jesus would heal the man versus rejoicing that somebody got healed today. That's where I want to be. Amen. Good. Amen. Well, I, don't think that's really, I don't think that's really a refutable point. <laughs> Driscoll? Please. I love you, man. And I'll tell you what. Um, give him a thumbs up. I will give him a thumbs up. And I'll say this, you know. <laughs> If people meet Jesus, is there a wrong way to do that? Right. Yeah. yeah. You know, yeah. like, I mean, because it, it's easier to be a critic than a pastor. Yeah. Um, and every pastor would say, God works in spite of me by his grace. Mm -hmm. And that just shows how powerful the gospel is. So to Hallelujah. critique the man and his method is only to make the gospel more glorious. Yeah. yeah. Amen. Amen. Yeah, how can you preach the gospel without that passion and urgency? Right. There, there's a great story in, in history. It comes right out of the city of Chicago. Most preachers have heard it. When Moody preached, sent everybody home, preached the gospel, sent everybody home, and then the Chicago fire hit. He promised God, after all the devastation, that he would never again preach without giving people an opportunity in some way. Mm. Of course, he, he didn't have people come forward. They used counseling rooms or yeah. inquirers rooms. It, the, the method is not the issue. The urgency and the passion of the gospel and, and, and bringing people to, to an encounter with Jesus Christ, that's what matters. Well, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were pleading through us. Mm -hmm. We implore every man to come to the knowledge of him. I mean, if that, I mean, it's in the scriptures, brothers, and to be casual or indifferent, to be so up in my head about the, uh, uh, the recipe uh, that I that I can't even uh, come forth with within the framework of my own personality an urgency I don't think that that honors well, the gospel think, we've been given. Don't you think that evangelistic style churches that that focus on evangelism they get categorized as superficial and shallow and a mile wide and an inch deep and 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 don't you think we need to try to overcome that and help people understand that that this passion, this urgency, this begging, this pleading ought to be a part of every New Testament church. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Well, amen. I'm, I'm, I'm working on a, a book right now called Vertical Church, and I really believe that the key is not to be an evangelistic church or to be a discipleship church. I really believe that if the focus is on honoring God and honoring Christ, more disciples bring more glory to God, and better disciples bring more glory to God, and a biblical ministry is invested in both, as you said earlier. I care about both, not just getting them in, but growing them up and sending them out again. And, uh, you know, God help all of us to be more balanced in those regards. We're going to take some questions now. And uh, the one that's up here, I'm going to go to question number three if I can. Um, it says, uh, what role uh, does baptism play in the presentation of the gospel? I think we've talked about that a fair bit. Let's go to the next question. Um, how does uh, emotion uh, play into a gospel uh, presentation? Uh, Stephen, emotion is important. Yeah, to me, it, it plays heavily into a gospel presentation, uh, both in a positive way and a negative way. Uh, but I do believe that engaging people emotionally is, is absolutely within the bounds of the New Testament preaching and teaching model I see. When, when Paul was, you know, I'm on this passage about his farewell to the Ephesian elders. I just can't get out of it I'm trying to see what did Paul say in summation of his ministry? He said, you know how I live. This is Acts 20, uh, 18. Uh, the whole time I was with you, 
I served the Lord with great humility and with tears. And uh, he was tested by the plots of the Jews. You know that I have not hesitated to preach anything that would be helpful to you. Uh, I've taught you publicly and from house to house. And I've declared to Jews and Greeks that they must turn to God in repentance. There's a lot of content there. There's also a lot of heart. Mm -hmm. To pit the two against each other is a false dichotomy that I'm unwilling to embrace. To say that utilizing natural means Mm -hmm. to help someone in a moment of spiritual decision. We all do things in our church like roofs, amplification systems, uh, climate control. We're all trying to meet physical needs to a certain extent. It can become manipulative. Uh, There is definitely a danger in everything, but there's also a danger in a cold, indifferent preacher who is simply discharging some sense of duty. Or I did nothing so that I could make sure I didn't do anything wrong. I'd rather have a hot heart. I'd rather have a hot heart. I'd rather go into Christmas and Easter like I'm going into a burning building trying to pull out dying people and bring them to Jesus. I would rather apologize for that when I stand before God than being indifferent. Yeah. That's well, where I'm choosing to be at this point in my well, ministry. And we don't, we don't have to wonder what Jesus' heart is on burying the napkin, right? Like, I didn't do anything wrong. I didn't do anything wrong. Here it is, just like you gave it to me. Really? Really, that was not great, as yeah, I remember. You know, I think we make the... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think we make the assumption that to somehow to be passionate and emotional is to be inauthentic, which Thank is you. crazy. It's absolutely crazy. I don't think you can share the gospel without, without, without loving people without being baptized in love, without connecting to the hearts of the people, and uh, that we're whole people. And so when you share the gospel, you've got to care about that person's soul, care about their destiny, care about their sins, care about their bondage. And I think that gives authenticity to our message. Well, Martin Lloyd-Jones said, Martin Lloyd-Jones said, uh, a man who can speak dispassionately about these things has no right to be in a pulpit. I mean, Martin Lloyd-Jones is, is, a, is a great uh, mentor in a lot of matters of preaching. Uh, he said, uh, preaching is theology coming through a man who is on fire. Yeah. And, and uh, a, a theology that does not catch fire is a defective theology. So God help us not to compromise the gospel, but God forgive us for being so up in our heads about the content of the gospel that we can't even open the cage door and let the lion out to see some people's hearts for the glory of the kingdom. All right. I'm edified by both of you. And I think this has been a great conversation full of grace and truth. Thank you.